fine, fine. Yeah, that's a very joint sword because. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. So uh, here we have uh, Dr. Jimmy. He is an orthopedic surgeon and he is um, working in the NHS. And he's he's got a lot of years experience. And uh, uh, so here uh, he thank you, doctor, for ac accepting our invitation. So he's going to give a talk on general orthopedics. So we can ask our doubts and maybe uh, at the starting, doctor will give an introduction. So welcome, doctor. Can you on your video, please? All right. Okay. Uh, thank you, um, the Orthopedic Society of uh, Plavan University, Bulgaria, and especially Thank you very much to Alan Philip for introducing me and also for inviting me for, for this class. The Plavan University is uh, very much in my heart because my eldest daughter, Elsa Jimmy, studied there and she and her uh, flight mate, Sherin, uh, both of them are doing uh, clinical attachment in United Kingdom now. And Christina Jimmy is a third year student there at Plavin. And her uh, flight mate is uh, Neha. OK, thanks again. <clears throat> As you know, the orthopedics is a very wide topic. Previously, many of the orthopedic problems were managed conservatively without surgery. Nowadays, the trend is to do more, more of it by surgery or operatively but it also depends upon the experience of the surgeon the setup facilities uh, affording power of the people the country etc new and new techniques are coming into market and into orthopedic surgery as as similar to many other uh, surgical specialties and scientific modalities. Over the past 34 years, orthopedic surgery has changed drastically from splints, traction, plasters, bed rest, etc., to interlocking nails, arthroscopic keyhole surgeries, joint replacements, uh, uh, advanced uh, deformity correction of the spine, uh, limb salvage, joint uh, tumor surgeries, deformity correction using early technique, limb lengthening, etc. So it is a specialty with many subspecialties, including hand and wrist, upper limb, shoulder alone, then uh, neck surgery, uh, spine surgery, pelvis surgery, lower limb surgery, soft tissue knee surgery, lower limb arthroplasty, pediatric orthopedics, etc. So, so there are so many subspecialties. Let's uh, start with fracture, which is the commonest problem. Pardon? Okay. Do, if, if some of you can unmute, if all of you can unmute, and when the questions are asked, you can, I mean, unmute. Otherwise, you please mute. All of you please mute, mute, and when questions are asked, you can unmute and ask. All right. So, fractures. Can you all hear me? Yes, doctor. We can hear you. Yes, right. yes. Thank you. All right. Okay. So for the late comers, welcome uh, to the class. And uh, I think it is good afternoon to everybody. You know, good afternoon, doctor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Fracture is a break in the continuity of bone. That's the definition of the fracture. It could be due to trauma or pathological, you know, due to fall or our hand got hit on something, etc. 
So they are called traumatic fractures. Pathological because of the weak bones, because of infection or tumor or osteoporosis, that is weakening of the bone due to old age or vitamin D deficiency. Uh, fractures can happen. The fractures may be, as you all know, simple or complex, like a simple break. Or it could be compound, which means open fractures. Fracture that is communicating to the exterior is called an open fracture. And depending upon the shape of the fracture, the fracture may be simple or combinated and also um, transverse. Wedge fractures, then spiral, segmental, combinated. So wedge means there's a wedge of bone. Spiral means it's broken spirally. And depending upon the displacement, it could be, uh, you know, anthroposterior displacement, lateral displacement. It could be an angulation. Angulation can be measured. It could be an anthroposterior or lateral angulation. It could be rotation. It could be an inward rotation or outward rotation. Then there could be impaction. The fracture may be Fragments may be crushed together and impacted, or it can be distracted that there is a gap between the fracture fragments because of the pull of the muscles. Then there are other types of fractures like stress fractures. When repeated micro trauma is given, the fracture happens after some days or weeks. For example, March fracture, where the soldiers who are not accustomed to long march and start marching, they get metatarsal fractures or calcaneal or even lower endotibia fractures. Then depending upon the location also, the fractures may be classified like epiphyseal, metaphyseal, diaphyseal, then intraarticular, extraarticular, etc. You know, the open fractures can be classified uh, depending on how much open it is. If it is less than one centimeter with uh, minor combination and minor contamination, it is type 1, gastro and Anderson type. If it is 2 to 10 centimeter with moderate combination, moderate contamination, it is gastro and Anderson type 2. And if it is severe combination or severe contamination, more than 10 centimeter, it is crystalline and it's in type 3. And the type 3 itself is divided into A, B, C. A means it can be covered with a soft tissue cover, like a muscle flap. Uh, B means severe combination and uh, severe contamination. It cannot be, uh, I mean, sorry. Type 1 is it can be closed. Type A is it can be closed. Type B is it has to be covered with a muscle flap. So it is more contamination and the tissues has to be depurated and a muscle has, flap has to be fitted. Type C means there is injury to the nerves or blood vessels. The limb may end up in amputation. Similarly, the fractures in children are also classified. You know, depending upon the pattern of fracture. So, uh, that classification is called Sartre-Harris. Type 1 is uh, the fracture that affects the epiphyseal plate, but a simple shaking of the epiphyseal plate. Type 2 is uh, the fracture that passes through metaphysis and part of the epiphysis. I mean, uh, part of the growth plate. Uh, and a separate fragment can be seen that called Thurston Poland side. Type 3 is the fracture that goes from uh, the growth plate to the epiphysis. Type 4 is the fracture that goes from metaphysis through the growth plate to the epiphysis. Type 5 is crushing of the growth plate. So the, depending upon the type of fracture, uh, the severity is more. See, there is a crushing of growth plate. There is chance for uh, reduced limb length and uh, deformity formation in future. And type two fractures has got more prognosis than type three or four because it do not go to epiphysis. 
uh, it is mainly metaphysis. Similarly, simple fractures has got better union rate and prognosis compared to the more complex fractures or open fractures. So what are the signs of fracture, you know, signs and symptoms? There will be pain, swelling, immobility, tenderness, crepitus, that means grating sensation when the fracture fragments are moved. Then loss of transmitted movement. When the limb is moved, the upper part of the limb do not move. Doctor, then, what yes? are the uh, treatments for the open fractures? Is only the non-surgical or the surgical treatment options are available? Yeah, so, okay. I, I'll be coming to that, uh, but let me complete this. So, um, so we were talking about uh, simple and uh, complex fractures, isn't it? Uh, and then the it, the fractures may affect epiphysis, metaphysis, diaphysis. So uh, depending upon that, the treatment is different. Depending upon age, also treatment is different. Now we were talking about signs and symptoms of fracture. So the signs and symptoms I told you. So what are the complications? The immediate complication is injury to nearby blood vessels, nerves, or tendons or it can become open, and then compartment center. What is compartment center? Increase in the pressure in the closed osteofacial compartments of the limb. Uh, th that can press upon the nerves and blood vessels inside that particular compartment. For example, forearm has um, volar and dorsal compartments, um, and uh, the uh, leg has anterior, lateral, and uh, superficial and deep post posterior compartments. So in this each compartment, it is covered by fascia and bone. So the muscles or uh, will uh, will get less blood supply if the pressure increases and press upon the nerves or blood vessels. So that can show be show, seen as numbness, tingling, loss of sensation, pallor, uh, uh, pain while stretching the muscle. And that is the um, most important sign. Stretching the uh, uh, fingers or the uh, the toes the pain will be severe because the muscles are partly dead. So these are, these are emerg orthopedic emergencies. Um, so compartment syndrome, then fat embolism, thromboembolism. Uh, these are all, uh, or fracture can end up in a dislocation. So the long-term problems could be because of the change in the shape of the uh, joint, for example, if it is intraarticular arthritis, the stiffness of the joint. Then, if it is open fracture, it could be osteomyelitis. Uh, as I told you, in children, it could be growth disturbances. It could be, you know, when the bone forms in the muscle. That's called uh, Waltman's ischemic contracture. There will be severe contracture of the. And there could be pay, long time pain. That is a pain syndrome. Chronic pain syndromes can happen because the fracture may not unite. Fracture may unite in a wrong position. There could be deformities. So. All these uh, osteoporosis. Okay, now you were asking me about uh, the management of the uh, open fractures. So, open fractures management depends upon the contamination and the classification, as I told you, the size of the wound. If it is a simple uh, open fracture, then we can wash it and close it. But if it is uh, moderately contaminated, as I told you, type 2, then we have to debride it, wash it. Uh, we have to use some two liter saline to irrigate it. You know, dilution uh, reduces infection. Then uh, we may, if there is a muscle deficiency, we may have to take the help of the plastic surgeon and cause it with the, the help of plastic surgeon that flaps. If it is a um, type three fracture, then sometimes, uh, you know, we have to do extensive debridement and then second sense stage surgery, the limb has to be temporarily immobilized with external fixator in slow plate and screw. And then antibiotics, we have to give antibiotics, especially penicillin for uh, uh, wound that is contaminated with uh, mud to prevent tetanus and tetanus immunoglobulin and tetanus injection. And then generally, if it is not very contaminated, it could be cephalosporins and vancomycin and gentamicin. So if there is too much, you know, like agricultural dust, then we have to use uh, metronidazole. 
when especially uh, contaminate uh, the wound that is contaminated with the agricultural sewage, sewage or agricultural material has to be immediately debrided within one hour or so. Uh, if it is moderately contaminated, maybe within six hours. But if it is not very contaminated, then it can be delayed up to uh, 24 hours, depending on the availability of the uh, plastic team. Uh, see, this is a this compound fracture is something which has to be dealt by a senior orthopedic surgeon. Uh, and if there is a plastic surgery team, they have to consult plastic surgery team. We have to take x-rays. If there is a reduction in vascularity, we may have to do arterogram, uh, CT scans, MRI scans, you know, examine the limb, maybe uh, measure the compartmental pressure if there is suspicion of compartment syndrome. All these things are so has to be done. And the rehabilitation is prolonged with physiotherapy, and uh, orthotics and other modalities. Okay, any questions in relation to the infection? Sorry, in, in relation to the fractures. Mm, doctor, like what is the role of uh, physiotherapy in the recovery process? As I told you, you know, most of the fractures, uh, they are near the joints. Uh, even if they are not near the joint, because we have to immobilize with plaster or some, uh, uh, or the patient has to undergo surgery and then temper, uh, has to uh, undergo a temporary mobilization, they may end up in stiffness, especially the intraticular fractures. And that uh, the amount of stiffness de uh, depends upon the age also. For example, combinative fractures at the shoulder of uh, pa patients above 60 years or uh, uh, that of elbow uh, above 60 years will end up in severe stiffness. So we may have to uh, consider all these factors when doing surgery. Because sometimes conservative management is better than operative, especially in elderly, because even if we do surgery, it will end up in stiffness. So uh, sometimes conservative is better uh, and physiotherapy. And most importantly, now the trend is to do early mo uh, mobilization. So the early mobilization has lots of a lot of advantages. That is, um, even uh, exercise at uh, you know, the bed and then do surgery or whatever that is necessary and uh, discharge the patient as early as possible and make the patient walk or make the patient mobile as early as possible with the help of crutches, etc. Uh, because the, the advantage is to prevent, as I told you, uh, deep vein thrombosis, that is DVT, uh, blood clot formation, then stiffness, uh, uh, reduce edema, reduce osteoporosis, and to give better strength to the muscles. And also mobilization will increase the blood supply to the fracture area and will induce early healing. Is it clear? Okay. So, yeah, tell me. Any questions? Did you ask Christina? Any more questions? Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So, see, the duration of the healing of the fracture also depends upon uh, the location and the age of the patient. For example, um, a fracture or the distal end of radius, that is wrist fracture, will heal in three weeks in uh, children five to ten years and maybe four weeks in children below 15 years, but it may take six weeks in uh, adults. Similarly, for example, tibia fracture. In children below two years, it may heal in just three or four weeks. And in children, it may take, say, six to eight weeks. And in adults, it may take even four years. So there are some special fractures where the vascularity is compromised. For example, fracture neck of femur in elderly above 60 years may not unite. So we may have to remove the head and then fit in a process is called, uh, you know, uh, or osteomor processes or some implant, Thompson's processes, to act as head of the femur. Uh, but if the patient is active and uh, uh, say between the age of 60 to 75, then it's better to do total joint replacement because the hemiarthroplasty or partial joint replacement can end up in wear and tear after two years with pain. So if the patient is active, it's better to do total joint replacement instead. For example, scaphoid fracture, there is less vascularity in some areas. So it's a small bone, but it takes some four, four, year, four months to unite. And some part of the scaphoid, especially the proximal fold, the vascularity is low. So we have to fix those fractures early. 
identify them early. Another is talus fracture, where the vascularity is uh, minimal. So we have to fix them properly. So, and another is management of fractures. You know, the intraticular fractures has to be reduced perfectly uh, to prevent uh, irregularity inside the joint sur surface, which may lead to osteoarthritis later on. But extraarticular fractures, the main thing is to get a reasonable alignment, whether it is by surgery or by plaster. But um, um, to early mobilize the patient to prevent stiffness, etc. Uh, so the, because the function is more important than perfect uh, reduction of the fracture. So if there is a reasonable reduction, it should be fine because we have to rest now the more modern trend is to respect the biology and the vascularity. If you strip, strip too much tissues to reduce the fracture by surgery, it is not good. So there are some fractures which are mostly treated conservatively, like distal end of radius. Uh, but now there is a more trend for more surgical management. And there are certain fractures which can only be treated surgically. For example, as I told you, fracture neck of femur. And this fracture patella, which is separated because of the pull of the quadriceps, we have to bring it down and do tension band wiring. For example, another is fracture olecranon that is separated because of the pull of the triceps. We have to bring it down and then fix it with plate if it is combinated, otherwise tension band wiring. Fracture angle, if it is displaced and the angle joint dislocated, we have to reduce it and fix it because these are small bones at the tip of the uh, tibia and fibula, you know, medial and lateral malleolus. It will be, it, these are unstable inside the plaster. So we cannot treat them with plaster. We have to treat them with uh, uh, surgery only. And then plaster treatment also, if the fracture is semi-united, we can change it over to braces. For example, humerus fracture. So that there will be, we can give early mobilization. Similarly, tibia fracture, after six weeks, if it is semi-united, we can uh, uh, give sermiendo plaster where the patient can walk over the plaster. The, the plaster is only up to the patella tendon and the patella tendon area where the weight of the uh, patient. So there will be micro motion that will promote healing. Now, now there are different types of uh, materials we use like uh, plate, plate and screws, interlocking nails, etc. So intramedullary devices, that when it is, it is passing through the axis of the bone. So it bears the weight of the bone more. But if it is, you know, on the surface like plate, it is less weight bearing. So the fracture has to be very stable. You know, if it is highly combinated, then the uh, intramedullary devices like interlocking nails are better. Uh, and there will be less stripping of the muscle. So these are the advantages. So intramedullary nails, you know, we pass two screws through the bone and the nail or the uh, on the top part and on the bottom part. So that the Fracture is fixed. I think we'll go for questions. Any questions in relation to fractures now? Uh, doctor, you told that uh, the infections are one of the complications of the fractures. So what are the complications other than the infections? Okay. Uh, I did not say that the infection is complication of all the fractures. I said Infection is the complication of the uh, open fractures. And of course, the fractures that underwent surgery uh, with plate and screw, etc., there is a rare possibility of infection. As I told you, there are two types of complications for fractures. One is acute and then chronic. Acute, that is injury to the nearby blood vessels, nerves or tendons or compartment syndrome or fat embolism, like for example, femur fracture. The fat can go to the lungs and produce fat embolism syndrome, with, uh, you know, uh, breathlessness, and it can go to the brain and cause unconsciousness and death. Or blood clots can come because the uh, muscles are not pumping, like for example, calf muscles, and that can go to the heart and produce thromboembolism. That, and uh, blood clots forming in the uh, calf is called deep vein thrombosis, as you are aware. And then the long-term complications, as I told you, is stiffness, Walkman's it's contracture, uh, chronic pain syndrome, fracture may not unite, Fracture may unite in a wrong position, osteoarthritis, osteoporosis, uh, disuse atrophy of the muscles, uh, growth disturbances, etc. Okay. Uh, doctor, I have a question. 
uh, have you encountered any particularly severe fracture in your career like and if so could you like provide some examples like the worst case you have witnessed mm <laughs> i have seen so many worst cases because uh, i did my post graduation in 1994 so it is probably 30 years now so it so it could be multiple fractures when the fractures are multiple then first you need to do uh, as per, per the atls protocol you have to stabilize uh, do according to the airway breathing circulation bandage splinted transport or uh, you know that that pathway so you have to stabilize you have to control the airway intubate if necessary stabilize the cervical spine uh, uh, check the breathing if necessary give mouth to mouth breathing or intubate and then do cardiac message if necessary then uh, start iv line and uh, give uh, fluids or blood depending upon the investigations if it, there is blood pressure drop especially in multiple fractures or fractures with pelvis there could be injury to the abdominal structures like intestine or kidney in some fractures that can also produce bleeding and multiple chest fractures rib fractures can produce pneumothorax or uh, hemopneumothorax so these are the emergencies which we have to manage and in such cases if multiple fractures are there our aim is to immobilize the fracture because if the fracture is you know mobile then it can end up in fat embolism thromboembolism more injury to the nearby structures etc so uh, the stabilization is initially with splints and later on with external fixatives so it can be quick you know it, it is not a, a final treatment but the initially can be fixed with external fi fixatives so, so they are immobilized and once the patient is stable after maybe after some 10 days say we can do one after another elective surgeries like plating etc so that is one and then another is damage control surgery if there is a common fracture if there is a abdominal trauma etc we so there is because of the trauma itself there is a already an insult and if we do multiple surgeries then there is second insult isn't it so we have to minimize the number of uh, the time of surgery it is only to control the bleeding or uh, remove the contamination etc not doing too much that's called damage control surgery okay so that's it that's one then there are some fractures which which are late to unite for example lower end of tibia where the vascularity is precarious uh, especially if it is open uh, then we may have to do bone grafting maybe after 5 6 months if it is not unitating we have to do bone grafting sometimes we have to change the na uh, nail uh, with another larger nail and rim the medullary canal that's called exchange nailing sometimes the implants can break for example uh, dynamic hip screw done for the intertrochanter fracture if the patient weight bear early or if there is too much osteoporosis or if it is not fixed properly it can break and then end up in non union and then you have to revise the surgery with some other specialized plates so all these complications can happen in fractures and you have to manage accordingly okay thank you doctor i think we will move on to uh, the dislocations dislocations can be acute that is happening immediately and chronic that is long term dislocation it could be congenital by birth itself for example uh, ddh you know developmental dysplasia of the hip producing dislocation uh, or arthrogryphosis producing dislocation of multiple joints including knee etc these are congenital disorders then traumatic for example after, after playing shuttle tennis or uh, football patient fall and then develop dislocation of shoulder especially anterior dislocation you know anterior dislocation is common for shoulder and posterior dislocation is shoulder for uh, common for hip and posterior lateral dislocation is common for elbow so there are certain dislocations that are common then there are fracture dislocation when the fracture happens uh, the for example the elbow dislocates or the ankle joint dislocates or even the shoulder joint can dislocate so these are fracture dislocations so these are all part of trauma and then uh, there are recurrent dislocation for example shoulder can dis once it is dislocated the muscles around the jo shoulder joint called rotator cuff that is below the deltoid that's go these rotator cuff muscles are supraspinatus infraspinatus latissimus dorsi and teres minor they can rupture and, and the capsule also can tear this Uh, and also there could be minor fractures called hillsack lesion in the head of the humerus this can predispose for further 
shoulder dislocation. Then the patient has to undergo shoulder stabilization surgery. Arthroscopically, there is a procedure called lateral jet procedure in which the acromion process is fitted into the uh, neck of the anterior neck of the uh, scapula, um, or the uh, the capsule has to be uh, tightened, etc. Or the rotator cuff muscle has to be switched by keyhole surgery or by open movements. And recurrent dislocation of patella that can happen because of the uh, uh, multiple because it may be because of generalist ligamentous laxity or at a, a particular age like 10 to 20 years especially in women because of the hormonal changes uh, uh, it could be due to multiple other causes like change in the shape of the uh, quadriceps mechanism the pull of the quadriceps mechanism change in the q angle change in the cochlea of the um, femur uh, the change in the height or shape of the patella etc or change in the pull of the medial or lateral quadrilateral ligaments of the knee. So if it is recurrent, even after doing quadriceps of vastus medialis obliquus exercises, then it has to be treated surgically by, you know, changing the alignment with the shifting of the tibialis, tibial tuberosity more downwards, or uh, tightening of the lateral structures, sorry, medial structures and uh, loosening of the lateral structures to prevent dislocation, etc. So it depends upon the uh, location also. And dislocation say high. What is dislocation? Dislocation is the displacement of the articular surfaces of the bone. Partial dislocation is called subluxation. So dislocation is a highly painful pro problem. It is more painful than fracture, and it has to be reduced immediately within an hour or so. Otherwise, it can end up in more problems like injury to the nearby blood vessels, nerves, or tendons. Injury to the nearby blood vessels, nerves, or tendons. Um, then uh, you know stiffness. Uh, it may it may not be able to be reduced if it is left for a long time. Then we have to do open reduction instead of closed reduction. So um, you know there's certain dislocations ends up in a particular type of complication. Like for example, shoulder dislocation ends up in injury to axillary nerve. You know where the regimental band has less sensation and deltoid muscle paralysis. And your shoulder dislocation can produce. Uh, uh, femoral nerve paralysis, posterior shoulder dislocation can produce sciatic nerve, um, elbow dislocation can injure the uh, posterior androsis nerve or sometimes ulna nerve depending upon the position of the dislocation. So this is also true for some fractures. For example, fractured neck or fibula can produce common peroneal nerve injury. Okay, supracondylar fractures commonly produce uh, anterior branch of the median nerve injury. That is anterior androsis branch. Uh, so it depends upon the location. Certain fractures are notorious for non-union. For example, um, lateral condyle fracture of the elbow can produce cubitus valgus deformity and non -union. So as I told you, lower end of the tibia. Uh, Similarly, certain dislocations also has more complications. For example, hip dislocation can end up in avascular necrosis of the head of the femur, uh, which can later lead to osteoarthritis. So more, some dislocations are more serious than others. For example, finger dislocation, we can reduce and strap under local anesthesia. Uh, most of the dislocations are reduced under sedation. If not possible to be reduced under sedation, then they have, the patient has to be taken to the theater and uh, uh, has to undergo emergency close reduction. If that also fails, then open reduction. Okay. So any questions in relation to this? Can you hear me? Yes, doctor, no questions. Anybody? No. Doctor, is there any like prevention methods to uh, prevent like joint dislocations who already had dislocations before? Any methods to prevention? Yeah, it is mainly for the shoulder dislocation. You know, the position of extremes of abduction and external rotation. Like when we play shuttle and tennis, when we serve. So that is the position where it dislocates. In such patients, when we examine, when we try to make extremes of abduction, external rotation, they will have an apprehension feeling. They will tell it is going to dislocate. Similarly, petal also, if you try to move laterally, they will have apprehension. That's called petal apprehension 
test. Uh, so these are the elbow. It, it doesn't normally end up in uh, dislocation, but yes, patella can. So that they have to avoid uh, uneven surfaces and uh, they have to do the quadriceps exercises and stuff. Um, okay, hip uh, normally dislocates because of the severe trauma, not like fall from a tree or something. Not not because of ordinary trauma. So it do not it is not usually recurrent. All right. Any questions? Doctor, okay. in case of uh, shoulder dislocation, is there any chance to reoccur it again? If the person had it once, is there any possibility? That's what I'm telling you. Um, if the it dislocates one time, there is at least 50% chance that it can re-dislocate. So, you have to call the patient uh, to the clinic after some six weeks and examine him and see if there is any uh, weakness of the rotator cuff muscles or, or if there is a severe pain, then we may have to do surgery. Uh, sorry, we may have to do an MRI scan to uh, confirm the diagnosis. And if there is severe problem, then he has to be treated uh, surgically, especially through keyhole surgery to suture the rotator cuff muscle, uh, shorten the capsule, etc. Or else, if it dislocates multiple times also, the patient has to undergo surgery. Especially nowadays, it is previously it was cutting of the subscapulate muscle and over suturing it, suturing one part of the subscapularis muscle or the other one. Okay, that's called putty plat procedure. But nowadays, it is instead of that, uh, changing, I mean, taking the part of acromion process along with uh, the muscles attached to it. You know what are the muscles? That is uh, the pectoralis minor and one more muscle. So along with the muscle, it is taken and then it is screwed to the trough in the uh, neck of the scapula, anterior neck of the scapula, so that it, it acts as a muscle sling. Okay, so okay, the subscapularis is also attached to uh, the chromium process. So it acts as a sling. All right. So let's move on to infection then. Uh, you know, infection can be due to hematogenous causes. Uh, uh, or due to surgery acutely. So acute infection can be due to uh, from blood or by surgery after plating, etc. or after an open fracture. So hematogenous infection commonly occur in children, uh, you know, and it, it especially affects the epiphysis where, sorry, the metaphysis where the, uh, the arterioles are tortuous. The organisms can get embolized there and then grow. Um, so um, uh, the metaphysial area, the infection is common in children. In children below one year, it can be due to E. coli. One to three years, it can be due to hemophilus influenza. But above three years, it is more mostly, and also in adults, also Staphylococcus aureus. And then there could be subacute infection, which is between acute and chronic infection. It is of different type, like it could be just early infection, it could be the metaphysial area, according to the classification, let's say classification for that. It could be the metaphysial area with onion ring formation. It could be the epiphysis. And then it could be diffuse. Similarly, chronic oste osteomyelitis also can be classified according to Cierney and Madder as uh, early then superficial. Sorry, early is medullary actually. It affects medulla. Then super superficial, that is superficial cortical. Then uh, um, deep cortical and then diffuse. So what is chronic osteomyelitis? If the osteomyelitis lasts for more than three weeks, then uh, the, some, some part of the bone may become dead because of the uh, loss of vascularity. And the organisms can persist on this dead bone for long. So we cannot treat it with antibiotics because there, is, there are no blood vessels going to the dead bone. 
um, and a newborn can grow grow over the dead areas called involucrum. And there can be openings in the involucrum called cloaca through which the dead bone and pus will come out through sinus to outside skin. So these are the signs of chronic osteomyelitis. Uh, the fever uh, will be less, there will be no fluctuation. But in acute osteomyelitis, there will be fever, redness, swelling. There may be fluctuation because of the superficial abscess. In that case, we may have to drain the abscess. Okay, so, and the um, blood count may be, WBC count, ESR, CRP, etc. will be high. But in chronic osteomyelitis, the blood parameters may, may be may not be high. Similarly, in acute osteomyelitis, at least 50% of the cases, we can get blood culture positive, but it may not be so in chronic osteomyelitis. So acute osteomyelitis is normally treated with rest, analgesics, splintage, uh, antibiotics, especially against staphylococcus initially, like uh, loxosilin or com uh, for, uh, I mean, comoxiclav or amoxicillin with uh, ambicillin, uh, ambiclox. And then, depending upon the culture, the antibiotic can be changed. Chronic osteomyelitis, there is no hurry in treating with the antibiotic. We have to get the blood culture as well as when we debride, we can take tissue samples and then do, do the culture and then treat it accordingly. So in chronic osteomyelitis, the infection can be eradicated only by, you know, debriding the dead bone and their dead bone and uh, washing it. There, there may, they, the area may have to be irrigated with the, uh, uh, with tube, tube irrigation system for five, six days. And then sometimes there will be big gap which has to be fitted with the flaps. For example, lower end of tibia, coleus flap, upper end of tibia, uh, gastrocnemius flaps, and in the foot it may be free flaps. So that will also bring vascular. And sometimes we have to put some bone graft to fill up the gaps. Um, but we are not sure that it can be eradicated 100% in all patients. It may persist. And similarly, plate and screw or you know joint replacement also can get infected, and the organisms can persist there, forming a biofilm. Uh, it's a mucopolysaccharide coating to which the uh, antibiotics or WBCs cannot penetrate, so the organism can persist there, there for long. That is called biofilm yeah, when there is a metal metallic surface. So, so there are different types of osteomyelitis, like acute, chronic, and subacute. And I told you rough, the uh, the rough outline of the management, and also uh, the complication of the one of the important complications of osteomyelitis is septic arthritis. Septic arthritis also can can happen without osteomyelitis. So septic arthritis means infection of the joint. It has to be aspirated and sent for culture, and see what organism or microscopy to see if there is any WBC. Then if if we found that it is pus or the microscopy show that there are WBCs, we have to wash it through keyholes are there, that is arthroscopically. And if it is too much, then we have to debride openly with the removal of the synovium and dead bone if it is chronic. And then gradual physiotherapy and things like that for septic arthritis. And also, of course, IV antibiotics. So in children, what happens is septic arthritis uh, can produce dissolution of the joint surfaces especially in children below two years because of this cartilage. Uh, and uh, you see, it, it also, if there is an osteomyelitis of the metaphyseal area, uh, in uh, uh, children above two, two to four years, uh, the organisms cannot penetrate the growth plate. But since uh, there is no barrier below two years, it can end up in uh, uh, septic arthritis and dissolution of the hip bone, then limb length discrepancy and growth problems in future. So all these things can happen. Chronic osteomyelitis may end up in, you know, amyloid disease, stiffness, you know, limb, et cetera, limb length discrepancy, et cetera. And acute osteomyelitis can end up in septicemia, death, as you are aware, yeah? So these are the, any questions on infection? Bone infection. Can you hear me? Yes, doctor. I think we are clear with uh, infection. All right. Okay. Mm. Now, another is osteoporosis. You know, so it is 151. Okay. So, osteoporosis. What is osteoporosis? Decrease in the bone material, isn't it? That is called osteoporosis. 
decrease in the bone mineral is osteomalacia. Osteomalacia can be of different types like rickets in children and osteomalacia in adult. Osteoporosis normally is a, uh, uh, it can be primary or secondary. Primary osteomalacia that is uh, can be due to uh, old age that is elder um, that is elder otherwise called elderly osteoporosis. That is because of the generalized decrease in the growth hormone, mobility, and function of the bone marrow uh, uh, and other hormones. Uh, but there is postmenopausal osteomorosis after uh, for, uh, 50 to 60, 50 years, where there is, this is due to the withdrawal of the estrogen hormone that uh, that is required for uh, bone formation. So that postmenopausal osteoporosis is more severe than gradual or slow osteoporosis of the elderly type. Um, then secondary causes of osteoporosis can be due to steroid, long-time steroid uh, you know, intake. It could be due to immobility uh, because of the fractures. It could be due to paralysis, for example, stroke and patient is immobile. Uh, it could be due to some bone weakening disorders like sickle cell anemia or thalassemia. Uh, etc. So it can be due to multiple causes, uh, the osteoporosis. There are certain syndromes that can also produce osteoporosis. You know, the many hormones are required for bone formation. For example, bone mineralization is supported by calcitonin and mobilization of the calcium uh, from bone is by parathormone. Parathormone also helps in absorption of the calcium from the gut and uh, uh, loss of calcium from the kidney uh, and vitamin D production. Vitamin D uh, helps in absorption of the calcium from the intestine and sunlight is required for you know conversion of the uh, cholesterol to vitamin D. 25-hydroxy, um, I mean uh, the vitamin D pre-metabolite and the liver function is required for conversion to 25-hydroxy uh, D uh, D2 and uh, kidney function is re required for uh, oxidation of 25 hydroxy in, into 125 uh, hydroxy uh, uh, vitamin D. So uh, the, uh, the intestinal problems, intestinal surgery, liver problems, kidney problems, hormonal problems, uh, lack of sunlight, lack of uh, mobility etc. also can affect uh, uh, calcium and phosphate metabolism and bone deposition. So certain uh, malignancies can produce uh, uh, neoplastic hormones like parathormone that can produce bone weakening. Anti-metabolite uh, therapy like methotrexate calls can produce bone resorption. So there are multiple causes. For example, radiotherapy can produce bone weakening. So there are multiple causes, but the common cause is primary osteoporosis and uh, especially in elderly for which they have to um, use milk, and cal uh, you know, egg, etc. and have some sunlight and do some moderate walking. But at the same time, when they walk, they have to be careful that there is good sunlight if necessary. They have to put on specs. The matter should not be wrinkled. Uh, if necessary, they have to use sticks, otherwise there is a tendency to fall and end up in fractures. There are certain fractures that are very common in osteoporotic people. For example, vertebral fractures, that is especially uh, more after 70 years, or fractured distal end of radius or approximate end of the uh, humerus, um, or fractured neck of femur, that is common between, say, 55 to 75, also interprocanty fractures. So intertrochanty fractures are seen more elderly, like 70 years, but fracture neck femur between 60 to 70. Then distal end of radius fractures may, can happen between 55 to 65. So there is some variation. So, so very very elderly people, the, there can be multiple vertebral fractures which produce tonic pain, and it may press upon the nerves producing uh, nerve weakness, but it is not very common. It's mainly pain. They may have to use some braces for some time. Very rarely, you know, something like the so-called kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty in which bone cement is injected to straighten the vertebrae or, uh, and, you know, the, the nerves associated with pain around the vertebrae are, you know, um, cauterized with electric electrotherapy 
to reduce pain. So, so many modalities are available. I think it is clear about, uh, then there are something congenital disorders like, you know, renal rickets, um, where vitamin D resistant rickets, where uh, these are all, you know, has got genetic preponderance. So, because of the change in the renal tubules, uh, renal tubular reabsorption of the calcium, uh, or uh, due to some pathologies of the kidney, like infection also can produce changes in the re reabsorption of the calcium. Uh, so, all these can produce uh, rickets. Okay, sorry, uh, the osteoporosis. So, rickets and osteomalacia can produce body pain and joint pain, uh, and osteomalacia can produce some certain loosened zone in the vertebra. Uh, there are kind of uh, fractures uh, with pain, but it, it need not be treated surgically, but with vitamin D, heavy dose of vitamin D. In children, uh, it is common, especially if there is low nutrition, especially in Africa, with the rickety rosary, that is, you know, beads on the uh, sternum, PG and chest, that is the sulcus in the sternum, then uh, metaphysical area is playing with, you know, the, the wrist area, there will be some thickening if you examine clinically. So all these are, uh, and in young children, you know, there will be changes in the skull, you know. So these are all features of the uh, rickets in children. So any questions? Uh, so doctor, hmm. um, uh, yeah. like, uh, how will be the, uh, the orthoporosis affect the surgery outcome? That is the orthopedic surgery outcome. Does it have any good or any bad outcome there? Uh, in relation to the uh, osteoporosis? Yes. Yeah. So, there, you know, as I told you, there is non-union and delayed union of fracture. When non-union means even after the sufficient time, the fracture, if the fracture do not unite, say, uh, even after sufficient immobilization and sufficient treatment and sufficient time if the fracture do, you know, do not unite. And the bone ends show sclerosis, sometimes pseudo joint formation. It is called non-union. Delayed union means there is a delay in the normal process of union, but it may unite at a later date. So the delayed union and non-union can be produced by so many factors. It could be due to distraction of the bone fragments, lack of immobilization or loss of vascularity. It could be infection. It could be osteoporosis. So osteoporosis is one uh, reason uh, or, or it could be even osteomalacia, but it could be uh, lack of some, some micro, uh, you know, nutrients, including, you know, co cobalt, molybdenum, magnesium, copper, uh, or, um, you know, could be due to deficiency of vitamin C, uh, etc. But commonly due to calcium enforcement. So, yes. So, all these things can delay bone healing. Yes. Any other questions? So I think now we will move on to arthroplasty. I think I heard that some of you are interested in joint replacement. So before which I need to talk about the, the osteoarthritis and different arthritis. You know, the, our joints can be affected by arthritis, that is inflammation of the joint. It could be uh, due to wear and tear of the joint, that is the osteoarthritis, or it could be uh, inflammatory arthritis. Uh, it, it, inflammatory arthritis uh, could be of the uh, of different type, like the commonest one is rheumatoid arthritis, where there is panis formation, mask vessel formation in, in the synovium, and that destroys the joint gradually because of the autoimmune process in which uh, our body immunity acts against our own uh, uh, body surfaces especially synovia uh, or tendons or tendon sheets producing inflammation stiffness pain uh, fluid collection etc and later on uh, so then um, so in rheumatoid arthritis there can be uh, later on deformities of the hand and tendons may rupture less function of the hand so the commonly rheumatoid arthritis affects uh, the knee and hand so the rheumatoid arthritis initially starts with the metatarsophalangeal joint that is classical rheumatoid arthritis then there is gout 
in which uh, there is increase in urate crystals, maybe because of alcoholism, obesity, or so many other reasons, or maybe in this uh, meat intake or uh, fish, dry, especially dry fish intake, or it could be due to some congenital things. So it could be due to multiple reasons, but uh, these can this can affect uh, you know uric acid production. It could be due to some congenital uh, disorders uh, affecting xanthine oxidase enzyme, uh, uh, which produces increased xanthine oxide, which can produce urine deposition. So uric acid normally affects the first metatarsophalangeal joint of the uh, you know of the big toe, producing inflammation. Then it, later on, it can affect knee angle, bursa, uh, like a tibial tendon uh, bursa or uh, olecranon bursa, etc. And there could be toffees, collection of the urate crystals on under the skin, like uh, tumors, and that's called uh, toffees. So, so second is gout. Then there are some rare uh, arthritis, like SLE, sickle cell anemia, sick, I mean S SLE, uh, systemic lepus erythematosus, or myofibralgia, producing uh, along with arthritis so and some congenital disorders producing arthritis so this um, osteoarthritis itself the the wear and tear as i told you that's the commonest one in uk i think 85 lakh people are affected by osteoarthritis per year around uh, um, 3 lakh people are affected by rheumatoid arthritis and 1.5 people are affected by other type of arthritis it's a very common uh, disabling problem. So osteoarthritis itself is of primary osteoarthritis without any cause, especially that happens in elderly because of the wear and tear. Uh, you know, there will be, pathologically speaking, there will be synovial inflammation, there will be loss of cartilage, then there can be, you know, cysts formed in the uh, metaphyseal region of the bone, and there could be overgrowth of the bone called osteophyte, and then later on end up in stiffness and pain and immobility. So, it, uh, so in India, the knee joint is more affected, but in Europe, it is more more of hip joint. So, both these areas, arthroplasties are done. Then it could be due to some other pathology. It could be due to death of the bone. Uh, for example, avascular necrosis of the hip, or hip uh, you know, the neck of the femur or head of the femur. It could be due to alcoholism or some certain uh, fat deposition disorders like thalassemia or Gauche's disease. Uh, sickle cell anemia, radiation, uh, cases disease, that is people going to the deep waters and coming up quickly can produce, uh, you know, bubbles in the jaw, uh, blood vessels that is producing that. So there are multiple causes. It could be even fracture, for example, talus or scaphoid, as I told you, that's vascularity. When there is a fracture, it can end up in uh, avascular necrosis. All these things later on can lead to uh, osteoarthritis or, for example, it could be due to congenital deformities or Perthes disease. Uh, which can later on form make the head deformed, producing osteoarthritis at a later age, uh, or uh, cubitus varus, or uh, valgus, or coxa varus, or, or uh, you know the knee varus or valgus. So all these things can change the uh, transmission of the body weight to the knee or hip or elbow, etc., producing wear and tear in one particular part of the uh, bone. So. It can be treated by joint replacement or osteotomy if it is because of the change in the alignment. You know, you can correct the bone deformity that can uh, make the bone transmission axis uh, in a different way so that, you know, the uh, affected area can be healed. Uh, or if it is early, we can treat it with physiotherapy, body weight reduction, analgesics, anti-inflammatory medications. If it is severely painful, we can use steroids. But if the steroids are used, multiple occasions after three four occasions then it may later on lead to increased uh, osteoarthritis so it has to be limited steroids can temporarily reduce inflammation but if it do not produce relief uh, after one week then it it is presumed that there is high wear and tear so we have to treat it surgery if it produces relief for say six months then probably the patient once the pain is less the patient can continue with physiotherapy and then the pain may not recur uh, or weight reduction, etc. Activity modification, including use of sticks. Uh, unless there is severe uh, wear and tear, um, we do not do joint replacement because joint replacement is a very major surgery. 
it has its own complication. Uh, let us move on to the treatment of rheumatoid arthritis. You know, rheumatoid arthritis, there are anti-inflammatory drugs, then steroids, non-steroid non anti-inflammatory medi medications, and then later on steroid medications, and then disease-modifying drugs like methotrexate or leflonamide, and then bioactive drugs are also available, which uh, work on the leukocytes to prevent aut aut autoimmunity. Um, and then, then there are splints, certain surgeries for deformities, tendon transfers. For gout, as I told you, you can use uh, sandin oxidase inhibitors. Initially, when there is acute attack, you can use colchicine and anti-inflammatory medications. Uh, for chronic, you have to use this way. And then food modification, like reduction of the meat and dry fish, etc. Um, and for osteoarthritis, as I told you, uh, there are multiple modalities. So of each arthroplasty, what is arthroplasty? That is replacement of the joint with the artificially, isn't it? It can be uh, due to artificial means or it can be uh, uh, without artificial implants, like, you know, debridement of the... Uh, uh, irregular bone and synovium and sometimes excision, for example, excision of the head of the femur. And so that the the, fe the neck of the femur hits on the um, gluteus medius ma muscle. So there will be less pain, but there will be some waddling when you walk and less, some weakness, but the pain will be relieved. So arthroplasty can be excision arthroplasty. It can be, you know, or sometimes you see we can fuse the joint, for example, uh, the, for example, finger joints or thumb or the toes. If it is painful, we can fuse it. But when function is required, it is better to do arthroplasty, uh, especially if the patient is active. You know, so arthrodesis is done, even knee arthrodesis is done in patients who are young and who are uh, who are manual laborers. Because when we do joint replacement, patient cannot do manual labor or sporty activities. They can do day-to-day -day, uh, normal activities, but not do too much sport or uh, manual labor. Um, so it is... Uh, but it is a very uh, pain relieving and gratifying surgery, a joint replacement, because now there are more, more and more modern materials and techniques coming into the market. Okay, so the arthrodesis is normally done in young, also done in young people, because the joint replacement can get loosened after 15 to 20 years. So we have to do a second surgery after 15 to 20 years. So uh, so it is normally kept for elderly people, say above 60 years. But if it is very severely painful, sometimes it is done early. But normally, it is uh, the normally uh, the total hip and knee replacements are done, and they are very rewarding surgeries. But there has to be bone and bone um, erosion. That means the bone above the joint and below the joint are very close together. That much erosion, and it is highly painful for the patient, and the patient is not able to day-to-day -day activities and BMI you know how BMI is calculated that is height in meter square divided by uh, sorry uh, the body weight uh, so if BMI is I mean the body weight divided by height in meter square body weight in kilogram so if the BMI is above 40 normally uh, the joint replacement is not done. The patient is advised to reduce the body weight. Uh, there are many techniques of reducing body weight. One is diet, another is abdominal surgery, uh, third is liposuction, uh, then fourth is exercise. Then if it is between 35 to 40, uh, you know, the blood pressure, blood sugar, cholesterol, etc. are checked and it has, if it is high, it has to be rectified. Later on, the patient is taken for surgery. It is below 35 or 30, then definitely the patient can undergo joint replacement. Because if the body weight is high, then there is more chance for loosening and failure of the uh, joint replacement. So before the surgery, the patient has to do some physiotherapy to improve the movement. And then patient has to undergo whether the patient is fit for surgery because it may take some two to three hours. And um, after the surgery, also patient has to uh, gradually mobilize with uh, initially uh, the patient can put full weight on the next day, uh, but uh, the driving is allowed only up to six weeks. And uh, uh, 
full activities are, are allowed only after three months. Mm. So, so there has to be assistance with the physiotherapy and blood thinness has to be used after the surgery to prevent blood clotting. For example, flexane, uh, that is, uh, you know, anoxyparin uh, or some other blood thinner uh, because blood clots can come from in elderly if they are immobile. So that's another. So what are the complications of uh, joint replacement? It could be immediate or delayed. So the immediate complication could be infection, injury to a nearby blood vessels, nerves or tendons. It could be DVT. Uh, it could be early infection. It could be hematoma, bleeding, non-healing or the surgical site, etc. So um, dislocation can happen early. Delayed complication also, the joints can dislocate. For example, hip joint dislocating. Uh, or it could be fracture, peripositive fracture if the patient falls, and if there is osteoporosis, it could be infection. The infection with implant is a bad thing. Sometimes, if it is early, we can wash it and debride it. But if it is late infection, then probably we have to remove the implant, then uh, do debridement first. Uh, that uh, it has to be done in stages, two stages. Initially, with the bone cement with the antibiotic. And then it has to be removed after six months and then a proper surgery uh, once the infection is eradicated. And of course, you have to give antibiotic. So what is joint replacement? Normally, how is this? Is it done? It is done with the uh, metal backup, stainless steel normally, on the, for example, in the acetabular area and in the uh, femoral area or in the, you know, femur, lower end of the femur and the upper end of the tibia. And over which... Uh, there will be polyethylene socket that is a plastic material uh, above the tibial component in the total knee replacement. And in the hip, it, there will be a head with the polyethylene over the femoral component. So there will be plastic in between the metals okay, to prevent wear and tear. Mm, so it is uh, cut in particular manner. The joint is shaped in particular manner and the implants are fixed with the polyethylene met metacrylic, a type of bone cement normally. And then this plastic material is kept. Sometimes we use co cobalt chromium instead of stainless steel or titanium also. And then polymethyl methacrylate was having also a wear uh, uh, producing uh, reaction. Now we have highly cross-linked poly, uh, uh, sorry, polyethylene, um, which has, um, which is treated in the factory under no oxygen vacuum uh, circumstances with gamma radiation to produce cross-links to prevent the uh, wear and tear. So uh, the implants can become loosened and, and that is called aseptic loosening without infection. With the infection also it can loosen. That's called septic loosening. So the uh, the loosening may be due to the wear particles from the metal or it may be from the polyethylene. Uh, so cobalt chromium, there could be metal allergy, metal toxicity that can go to the body also. So ceramics are also, that is substances made of aluminum are used. They have a tendency to fracture but they have, they are very tough, but sometimes they can fracture, but newer ceramics are better without fracture. So now the joint replacement is highly reproducible with good results. Say, I would say 90% of the results over a span of 15 years for, for the patients, 90% of the patients. And 75% uh, uh, of the patients are happy even after 25 years. So uh, highly rewarding, but we have to be careful. And the patient selection is also very important. And patient has to do certain things like you know, physiotherapy and, uh, you know, they have to uh, be assisted by occupational therapist to how to transfer at home with sticks and things like that. Any questions on this? Can you hear me? We can hear you, doctor. I think we're clear this topic. Yeah. Any Anyone of you? Anybody else? And doctor, for osteoarthritis, we discussed many treatment methods. So I mm. think some methods are expensive, like normal people cannot afford. So um, which method do you suggest for like normal people? There is nothing like normal people uh, see. Um, it depends upon the stage of the disease, osteoarthritic process uh, and the severity of the condition and age of the patient. So if it is early, then it can be treated with analgesics, activity modification, physiotherapy, muscle strengthening exercises, especially when cortis is, muscle is strong, then more weight will be taken by the muscle rather than the joint. So um, initially we were giving glucosamine sulfate, which is found to be not useful. So nowadays people don't use it. 
temporary relief can be given by steroids. But if it is very severe, then uh, conservative management, is, if, or if the conservative management fails, then there are only two options. One is arthrodesis, which is used in more younger patients, or osteotomy if there is change in the shape of the bone. Then there are some other treatments also available, partial joint replacement. If part of the joint is only affected, then you can do, for example, medial compartment or lateral compartment or patellar compartment. And only that need to be replaced. But probably by, say, after 55 years, then by 65, 70, if it ends up in uh, wear and tear of the older knee, then it has to be revised to total knee replacement. Then there is surface replacement for the uh, younger group in uh, hip also. Only top part of the neck head is removed, not the entire neck and their head. That is called surface replacement. It also can produce problems like fracture, and sometimes it has to be replaced later on. So it depends upon the country where you are in, whether you have insurance, whether there is a government system like National Health Service, like in England, where you know the government supports. But of course, the money is taken from your salary uh, every year. So that is used for NHS. Uh, so in India, many, many places uh, now, more, there are more facilities, even for poor people like medical colleges, Unlike in the past, there are more instruments available. So probably even the poor can undergo joint replacement to some extent. But of course, not in every country and not in every part of India. Or uh, uh, Of course, there are certain limitations. Yes. Any questions? Hello, I think... Now it is uh, at least one hour and ten minute. Now there are some other topics: um, low back pain, uh, osteoporosis, frozen shoulder, then sprain, sports injuries including arthroscopic surgeries, work-related problems including tennis elbow, foot problems including plantar fasciitis and problems including carpal tunnel syndrome, first aid and accident care, muscle and tendon injuries, orthopedic cysts and tumors, deformities including congenital deformities, orthopedic problems in children, plastering, steroid injection, braces and physiotherapy. So any of the topics you are interested, you can ask some questions, otherwise we'll, we'll move to some other topics. I'm giving you some time to ask questions. Can I ask something about the, the orthopedic speciality? Like, as a final medical intern, we are keen to explore various specialities. What inspired you to choose the orthopedic surgery? And, and what advice you would give to students like us who are considering this field? Okay. <laughs> orthopedic surgery is something where you cannot, you know, sit like a, a scientist and then do some research and or like sit in a clinic and see patients and go home. It, it, it involves some manual labor also and then you need to move around to on you know, different places like classroom or maybe wards or maybe uh, theaters, multiple different theaters. And that's one. Then uh, it is also highly ex exciting because you know there is there are new surgeries like keyhole surgeries, even keyhole surgery for wrist uh, displace, replacement of the uh, intervertebral disc, correction of the scoliotic deformities, uh, uh, limb lengthening, as I told you. Join, um, the entire femur can be replaced with mega processes nowadays because of the 3D printing. You know, But there are problems with it. But uh, the limb salve surgery with the specialized uh, chemotherapy and surgery, the limited surgery, you can save the limb. Uh, so there are multiple subspecialties, as I told you, like shoulder, elbow, et cetera, foot and ankle. So each subspecialty has its own new, new things coming. So it is uh, a world, it's a highly innovative field and high technology is applied, like computer assisted joint replacements, um, computer assisted spine surgeries, robotic joint replacement, robotic spine surgeries. And then the, there is a new research where you can use, you know, mosaic cells, uh, that is cartilage cells implantation to the uh, damaged joint, uh, artificial, I mean, the synthetic disc, etc. can be fitted. Artificial bone graft bone, uh, uh, is available, uh, you know, calcium, hemiadal calcium sulfate, artificial bone graft. 
so all these things um, are available so um, and new and new techniques are coming every day especially arthroscopic uh, techniques and other techniques so you need to update yourself by undergoing many workshops seminars conferences so it is a highly exciting field and it is highly rewarding for the patient or the patient who is suffering for a long time is rewarded or patient who is dying because of multiple fractures or other trauma the, it is highly rewarding but at the same time it has its own pain of long term training you know, uh, you may have to have struggle in theater sometimes with some type of fractures and, you know, especially revision joint replacement and the joint is infected and you have to change it to a new one. These are all tough things as well. So it depends upon your interest. Uh, uh, but if you are uh, not ready to do hard work and easy going, then you may have to opt for some other profession or some other specialty rather than orthopedics. But if you are interested and ready to hard work and train yourself and uh, update yourself, then this is a field for you. Thank you, Clear? Doctor. Yes. Yeah. And after graduating, uh, we have it. Uh, after getting the registration in UK, we have to do the FY1 and FY2. Mm. And you know how to choose this, uh, the orthopedic specialty after FY1 and FY2. After FI1, FI2, you probably have to enter into CT1 or C CT1 in orthopedics. Then you will get better training than CT1, CT2. And then go uh, uh, sit for some test and uh, do some audits and things like that. And then apply for, um, um, I think before that you need to do MRCs also for specialization. Of it. Then apply for uh, uh, the trainee post. So, after, uh, so, the, the, so there will be a, some... MCQ test and your uh, uh, CV will be considered and in the interview and you need to answer. And then once you get a index number as a trainee, then there is training after CT1, CT2 as ST3, ST4, ST5, ST6, so four years. And then you may be allowed to sit in the examination as ST7, FRCS examination, that is part one, that is theory, and part two is clinical and oral. And then once you pass that, so ST7, so after five years of uh, training as ST1 to ST7, then you, you have to enter into, so you, you get some graduation, that is orthopedic specialization of RCS. Then at the same time, you have to enter into specialist register for which just specialization, graduation is not enough. You have to do this many discussions, this many cases under supervision, like joint replacement, is that there are some index number of cases which you have to fulfill, uh, discussions, audits, etc. So this you need to show to the specialist registering body, and then they will register you as a specialist. Once you become specialist, uh, then you have to um, undergo some fellowships, like you subspecialize in hand or shoulder, put an angle for one or two years, doing some one one year fellowship in one place, another year fellowship in some other place. Once you become a uh, once you are done fellowship also, then you can apply for substantiative or uh, permanent uh, uh, consultant post, then you may get. But after four years also, you can try for locum, temporary uh, consultant post that is possible, temporary post without specialist registration also. But uh, if you have to be a permanent staff, then you have to do all these things. Yeah, otherwise there is something like this old articles 14, where you have already have a post graduation from some other country and have five years or more of experience, you may be allowed by the consultant and hundred department to consultant and one hundred department that you are capable enough to do FRCS examination. Then you can go for FRCS examination. But at the same time, you can pass FRCS and go back to your country and act as a FRCS doctor. But if you want to be in specialist register, then you have to be in a good center where they give you all these facilities to do surgeries and Okay. Uh, you have to accumulate that many number of index cases to test it to this um, special register. And then you, that route also, you can become a consultant, but it's, not, it's more, more easy through trainee route rather than a non-trainee route. Otherwise, you have to go for a GP and things like that. After coming to UK as FI1, FI2, you can write GP examination, four years GP training, then you can become a GP. Or you can go to some other specialty also. Is it clear? Uh, doctor, you have like so much years of experience. You worked in different countries mm. as 
professor in medical college but now finally why did you choose uk and to come and work there yeah because i was in i was in uh, i did my post graduation in india and uh, under graduation and then i went to switzerland for international position and then i was in india i was in a, as a lecturer in medical college and most of the time i was as a private hospital doctor or orthopedic doctor in multiple hospital and then i went to qatar for some some time and then came back and because i had been doing lot of social service activities i, I had been doing some management qualification like mba ma disaster management pg diploma guidance and counseling social care and pg diploma hr and I had conducted around 100 seminars on first aid uh, community health volunteering emergency medicine disaster medicine and conducted some 30 tv programs on fracture back ache etc and had been doing uh, organizational activities including that of orthopedic association as state it secretary national it committee member etc and because of this i had some financial constraints that was one of the reason why i went to qatar and then to uk but i also found that uk is one place where i can do further qualification like a fc and training so there are, it is multi pronged okay is it clear uh, what do you think uh, to do work in the india or the uk is better that is a personal choice i don't know because of the post covid era most of the countries things are not that very safe you know the job is not very secure there are more and more number of doctors everywhere uh, so yes too much competition in the private so people tend to opt for in especially in kerala you see the youth is going to australia new zealand canada uk isn't it or germany yeah uh, so that is a trend that that so probably there are certain reasons so you need to find out those reasons and whether you you have to decide which one is better for you okay what is the possibility to getting a job in uk because so many students are graduating it's and not that easy for even for getting my daughter is struggling because she has done two observations for one month she did observation for four weeks in general surgery and pediatrics when in her third year in uk and then she did uh, two one month observation in general medicine one month in general surgery in two different places she went to india for two months because her visiting visa is expired now she is doing fourth observation or rather third uh, clinical assessment because the third year one is not for clinical observation it is just called observation so after uh, getting the station to gmc she is doing her third clinical assessment now in kand area but she keep on applying for a for a post she has to yet get i heard that there are some 200 application for one post or 100 applications at least so people who have who do not require visa like uk citizens uh, or uh, people who have done uh, build up their cv with so many like <laughs> clinical assessments will have more chance for getting but there is competition but once they have done a fun of what happens is they people the graduates in uk or graduates of the people graduate children of the of the people who work in uk you know who have for example the daughter or son of sons of daughters or sons of the nurses who are working in uk but they uh, but they are, they were getting educated in bulgaria they come back so they don't require visa uh, so so all of them they do f1 f2 and once they it is done what had happens is they go to canada or australia or new zealand so there is vacancy in the middle grade level like the registrar level or in consultant level especially in, or, or the lower middle um, or the sho level after f1 f2 it is sho level and then the registrar level middle grade level and then consultant So as a job register level, there are more vacancies, but F one F two there is more competition. Okay, I so in so many uh, social media and news, there is a vacancy for doctors, but the students are getting struggle to getting. Yeah, that is because and... of the F one F two boss. There is too much competition, but above that, there is less competition because people are going to some other countries. This is what happens. Thank you. okay and uh, you know there are sports injuries you know what is uh, meniscal tear you know the cushion between the knee joint knee, uh, the the bones above and below the knee that is femur and tibia is called meniscus men can get teared due to some sportive activities like twisting strain or the ligaments inside the knee called anterior and posterior cruciate ligament which prevent knee from wobbling forwards or backwards can get ruptured then they have to undergo uh, 
knee joint surgery arthroscopically and uh, trim the uh, unstable meniscus otherwise it can get entrapped between the knee bones like a bucket handle and prevent knee movements and produce pain and buckling that means patient has a tendency to fall and the acl tear also can produce instability and later on osteoarthritis uh, especially in uh, people who are very active if the patients are not very active then probably we can Un, uh, subject the patient on physiotherapy, activity modification, braces, and they may continue without any surgery. But active patients, we have to do surgery for ACL uh, uh, rupture. Uh, and patients who have severe prop symptoms, uh, like locking of the knee, where knee is not able to be bent, or there is buckling that is tendency to fall, we have to do trimming of the meniscus, or sometimes if the vascular part of the meniscus can be sutured. The, lat the outer one third of the meniscus is vascular. So if, if it is sutured, then it can grow. But inner one two thirds is avascular. So we have to trim that. It will. It, but if it, we have to conserve meniscus also. If more and more meniscus is removed, there is more and more wear and tear to the knee joint in future. So we have to try to conserve the meniscus. But if mild cases, less symptomatic, we can try physiotherapy, analysis, etc. And then once the muscles are strong, sometimes meniscus can get healed also. So these are the common sports injuries that happens. Uh, nowadays, the arthroscopic ehold surgery is done for even elbow and wrist, shoulder, etc. But it's commonly done for shoulder rotator cuff tears or uh, you know capsular tears, recurrent dislocations, etc. With the weakness of the shoulder and stiffness, uh, and also knee mainly for the wear and tear of the knee joint, early wear and tear, that is for debridement or sign of infection. Sometimes if it is infected, early infection means through key or keyhole, we can trim the synovium and irrigate the joint uh, or for uh, uh, ACL reconstruction. ACL is reconstructed by taking bone patella, bone graft. That is uh, the part of the patella, one middle in the middle one third of patella and tibial tendon is taken as graft. And key and holes are made in tibia and femur at the position of ACL and it is Fix it with the uh, screws and uh, sometimes butter uh, arthroscopically. Uh, sometimes we use semi tendinosis muscle as a graft, the ten tendinous part of semi tendinosis, and uh, fold it into four parts, uh, four folds, and then it is fitted. So that is ACL reconstruction. PCL also can be reconstructed that way. Um, these are some of the common uh, arthroscopic surgeries. Any questions? Doctor, I have a question. Mm. Uh, my friend, he had a, a closely, completely uh, ACL tear. So is it advisable to do surgery or uh, physiotherapy? What do you think as a doc doctor's purpose? So that's exactly what I described to you. That depends upon the activity of the patient. If it is, um, if he is not sporty and the only office work and things like that, and a trial of physiotherapy is tried, and if he is comfortable and less symptomatic, then we can continue to try and conservative. But as it depends upon the age of the patient, if it is you know like say above fifty five, then probably uh, physiotherapy and later on if required, you can do the patient can undergo joint replacement when there is more wear and tear after sixty five years. But if it is a younger patient, then it's likely that the patient is going to have more uh, lifespan and more activity. It's better to do. Uh, ACL reconstruction and especially if it is symptomatic also. You understand? Okay, doctor. Yes, doctor. Uh, so, and also, doctor, regarding a herniated disc or slip disc, like what might be the complication? Okay, yeah. So the herniated disc uh, can happen acutely because of the sudden bending and weight taking, but that is very rare. It is more normally due to age related. Uh, chronic degeneration of the uh, disc. Uh, there is a nuclear pul pulposis that is in the center of the disc and annulus fibrosis. That is the outer part of the disc. So the outer part of the disc, uh, uh, you know, forms fissures through which the nuclear pul pulposis escapes. And this nuclear pulposis can produce inflammation inside the subdural space or epidural space, uh, producing pain. And also the herniated disc sometimes, normally it is herniated in the posterolateral area, sometimes in the central area, normally it is in the posterolateral area, press upon the existing nerve roots. You see at 
each level of the vertebrae, the rotator cuff vertebrae, one nerve root exits, the, the, the spinal nerve roots. It can pass upon the spinal reduce, producing weakness of the muscles supplied by the spinal nerve or creating pain, numbness, tingling, or loss of sensation. So, you know, the spinal cord ends at L1, after which we have only uh, uh, roots, no spinal cord. So, L1 to uh, as sacral level, when the uh, disc, you know, displaces you, uh, it affects only roots, producing root symptoms. But higher levels, especially, for example, neck, can press upon the spinal cord, producing upper motor neuron symptoms also. So, when there are upper motor neuron symptoms, we have to do the surgery earlier because the muscle weakness may persist, uh, um, may not come back if it is not done early. You know, there are certain signs for upper upper neuron neuro symptoms, uh, which we can elicit, find out if there is pressure on the spinal cord, not only the nerve roots. But in lower limb, it's mainly the roots that is affected. And the commonest uh, uh, problem is L4, L5. The second one is L5, S1. And in the cervical spine, it can be C5, C6, C6, C7. It's commonly C5, C6. But the cervical disc prolapse is not that common compared to the lumbar disc prolapse. And cervical disc prolapse surgery, the discharge is done through fr from the front of the neck by retracting the carotid sheath and taking out the disc. And sometimes we may have to fuse the disc if it is uh, with the cage or a bone graft. And if it is multiple disc level, we, we are removing multiple discs, then the, it has to be plated also to prevent instability. In the case of uh, thoracic spine, the disc prolapse is very rare. Sometimes it can produce thoracic radiating pain. And in the lumbar disc prolapse, if it is severe, and if it is not relieved after uh, a long time physiotherapy, and there is persistent weakness and loss of sensation, and the MRI scan shows that particular area uh, is the area of problem in uh, where the disc presses upon the nerve root, then we the patient has to undergo uh, disc surgery. But along with that, um, but, yeah, uh, doctor, but uh, they're saying that after surgery, like uh, they are only giving 50% chance for like uh, walking or running. They're not sure the patient will walk. So in case of that, what, uh, what will you advise to do? No, the the walking and running is not fully affected because of this problem per se. Paraplegia, that is a transaction of the spinal cord at one particular level, can produce a paralysis of the entire lower limb. Or strike, stroke can paralyze one part of the body, you know, when there is blood clot in the brain. But disc mainly press upon one particular area, uh, like uh, say, for example, when there is affection of the uh, L4 root, there will be weakness of the angle dole subtraction. When uh, L5 root is affected, uh, the uh, toad uh, plantar flexion is affected. And when S1 root is affected, the angle plantar flexion is affected. When L2, 3, 4 roots are affected, the uh, quadriceps weakness with the knee extension is affected. And uh, L1, L2, L3 is mainly inner thigh and anterior thigh. There is less of sensation. L4, it is the inner leg. L5, it is outer leg. And uh, L5 also the dorsum of the uh, foot and S1, S2 it is mainly the sole of the foot where, where there is loss of sensation. So it's not like weakness of the entire thing. And not only that, you know, 70 to 80 percent of the cases uh, over a span of some months, uh, the pressure on them uh, will reduce as the disc material degrades. So there will be um, uh, less weakness and the condition improves with the conservative means. If it is not improving only, we need to do surgery. The running, jogging, I don't think the, the trend is to mobilize the patient as early as possible. Because a patient with the low back pain problem, if it is bedridden, then it can become chronic. So you have to mobilize the patient with physiotherapy and encourage them to walk and gradually run if necessary, but not immediately. But, you know, the, in the olden times, it was long time uh, traction in the bed for two months that kind of a treatment is not given now because that can produce disuse of the muscle and exacerbate the problem. So it is early mobilization. So I don't think there is any big problem for walking. Walking is normally encouraged. Running, of course, that depends upon the pain. That has nothing to do with the weakness because the weakness is only for one part of the... So the um, patient is uh, an anger, anger, anger one and mm. uh, like uh, like he's, he was undergone steroid therapy for the pain. Mm. And like uh, it was that it was okay for like one to two years, and later then the pain re again, and it it, it again appears like when he uh, like doing works or running or walking. 
Mm. So, it's yes. or like, what are the things that we have to consider, or like, is there any complete recovery possible or not? So, there are certain you know, low back can can be produced by multiple uh, reasons. Could be due to the the commonest reason is to bad posture that is uh, driving the car in a bending position, sitting with the computer in a bending position, uh, taking weight uh, or doing bending activities without preparing the mind. You know, all of a sudden, um, because of the high body weight. Etc. or long travel. So these are or lying on the face down position. So these bad habits has to be rectified and muscles has to be strengthened for flexibility and strength. So that itself can relieve pain to some extent uh, along with the anti inflammatory medication. And the anxiety depression also can produce pain to some extent. So if the anti anxiety drugs have to be given. Uh, and even after this, if the pain is continued, then they have to undergo a MRI scan and see what is happening. And uh, uh, once MRI scan is done and surgery is done uh, or steroids are done, does it mean that another disc can pro prolapse or the same part of the same disc can prolapse? So we have to do another MRI scan and see where ex exactly. And the patient has to initially do physiotherapy and things like that. Uh, and if it is severe and if it necessary, he has to undergo surgery. Sometimes along with the, it may not be necessarily due to disc problem. It may be, you know, there may can be inflammation of the synovial membrane in the facet joint. Or uh, there can be wear and tear of the facet joints, uh, or you know there can be osteoporosis of the muscles. The low back end can be due to so many different causes. It can be pain, relating pain from gallbladder, from intestine, from bladder, um, from kidney, from you know even from skin. For example, um, so um, the viral infections can produce herpes zoster, uh, or it could be due to abdominal aorta dilatation. That is uh, aneurysm of the aorta. It could be uh, due to some nerve problem. We need to find out what exactly is the cause. Most commonly says it will do bad, bad posture. Just because of there is inflammation of the uh, joints, uh, uh, we can't do uh, spine surgery unless there is specific reason. Spinal surgery is not rewarding, so it, the the surgery has to be very selective. So along with spine, uh, this surgery sometimes if there is instability of the spine. So, for example, slipping of the L4 vertebra or L5, we have to fuse that part. For, uh, that is called spondylolisthesis. Or if there is a, a reduced space in the spinal cord, uh, then that is called spinal canal stenosis. Uh, that patient, will, after walking for some time, has to stoop to relieve pain and numbness. So then they have to remove some lamina to increase space to that spinal cord. So we have to find out the reason with, with the, by doing CT scan, MRI scan, clinical examination, and uh, do accordingly. Okay. Thank you, doctor. Thank you so much. I think, doctor, we can wind up the session. It's all right. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, extend my heartfelt thanks to uh, Dr. Jimmy Lonopan, okay. uh, okay. for the time. Uh, like we are grateful for your you know time and effort for the dedicated to sharing your knowledge, and um, yeah, with us and it's a it's a great honor for for us you to for us to have you, and. Uh, we especially thank you know students who have actively participated, and um, their contribution was valuable. And your presence, doctor, your presence made this event truly memorable. And we look forward to you know more such enlightening session in the future. Thank you once again. Thank you once again from uh, our society, our orthopedic society from Plevin. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. One minute. So if you have any queries, you can. Um... Con uh, go to my website where my contact details are. That is drjimmy.net. It is very easy to remember. D-O-C-T-O-R-J-I-M-M-Y.net. Or you can uh, contact me by my WhatsApp number. That is uh, the UK code 0044. And then 7470605755. I repeat, 7470605755. And also my email address is there. JimmyML, J I M M Y. ML, M M L, you know, ML, Jimmy ML two thousand two zero zero at gmail.com. Jimmy ML two thousand at gmail.com. So any of the means you can contact me. And thank you all the students for your patient is listening. Especially I thank Alan Philip and Muhammad Riaz for such grand welcome and thank thanks note and organizing this. Thank you very much to all of you. And we may regards to everybody. Thank, thank you. you thank you everyone. Thank you everyone. Okay. Thank you, Doctor.